Former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, Dr. Lisa Agbakoba SAN, has urged the Presidential Election Petitions Tribunal to conclude petitions on the February 25 presidential election before the inauguration of a new president on May 29. Agbakoba, in a statement he personally signed on Monday, urged the tribunal to adopt the procedures used for speedy conclusion of arbitration matters in its approach to the cases. According to him, the first is the interpretation of Section 134 of the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as to whether securing 25% of votes in the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, is compulsory to be president. And on the second, he queried the legality of a candidate being allowed to stand for presidential or vice presidential election when he's at the same time a senatorial candidate. Joining us now on The Morning Show is Dr. Olisa Agbakoba, a senior advocate of Nigeria and a former president of the Nigerian Bar Association. Good morning, uh, Dr. Agbakoba, and thank you for joining us on The Morning Show. Well, let's start with your... Good morning, Robert. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Uh, let's start with your proposal that... Uh, election petition cases at the presidential election tribunal can be concluded within seven days uh, if, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, tribunal, if, if the tribunal yeah. uh, takes uh, a more uh, 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 proactive uh, approach to it. But how feasible is that? Considering the fact that election uh, you know, petitions have time limitations, they have a time frame. The Constitution talks about 180 days. Uh, when you appeal, you have 60 days. Mm. And then we're dealing with an election in which you probably have over 10,000 polling units. How do you do all of that within seven days mm. and before May 29? Uh, shouldn't you yeah. be recommending that the Constitution has to be reviewed first? That challenge about time limitation should be addressed and properly defined. Otherwise, how would the, the courts do it in seven days or before May 29? Yeah, thank you very much. No, no. Uh, there's, a, there's a context in which I've, I've recommended that we should finish the petitions as fast as possible. And I think seven days is a good time to go. The fact that the consumer prescribes a time limit doesn't mean that that time limit must actually run. So the context of my call is that the policy is overheated. To that day, the Minister of Information is accusing Mr. Peter B of treason. People want interim government. There are all kinds of things going around. There's a whole shabang of things that seems to want to destabilize Nigeria. The DSS is shouting that there are people who are all over the place doing things. And the simple problem is just to resolve the election petitions. So the question is not whether it is doable, it is whether it can be done. So I start by saying that the judicial philosophy of Nigeria is about 100 years old. Nigeria is not known for speed. Why is it possible that Ghana finishes its own election petition in 30 days? So why can't we also do it here? Why should we have 360 days to do something that is fairly simple. So the new international gold standard, and I sit as a senior arbitrator in, in, in the city of London, and what we do is we apply case management. So my first recommendation is to say, the issues presented to the tribunals, are they amenable to quick resolution? And I think there are three issues which you've outlined that are amenable to quick resolution, one way or the other. Now, under the Kenyan procedure, those procedure, those questions that I've set out are decided in exactly one day. So if I was the presiding judge of the tribunal, I would give two hours to the petitioner to establish the case whether 25% of uh, FCT is relevant in the consideration of who is the president or not. I would give time to Mr. Tinubu's people to reply, and I'll deliver a ruling at 6 p.m. What's the difficulty? These are purely matters of law. So it is absolutely feasible. If those three questions do not succeed, then the part A of the petition would be now to do what you say, take the issue of electoral malpractice, which I concede will be a lot longer. But I have a strong feeling that those three questions I have set out 
can resolve the petition one way or the other. And it can be done in seven days. If, if Kenya can do it in 14 days, why do we need 360 days to do our own? Uh, are we not more highly judicially educated than Kenya? So come on, let's... I mean, and I also, would, without criticizing the lawyers in the petition, since they filed the petition, I haven't heard anything from them. There's all sorts of procedures by which you can front load a case, push it, set out procedural issues, set out jurisdictional issues for the tribunal to determine. That's number one. Two, the tribunal itself can offer its own motion, so or more to raise questions. So we've read all these petitions, and we think we can dispose of this petition if we set out some questions that, if taken, can resolve the entire thing. I'm concerned that the polity is overheated, and the way to go is to see if we can get the petitions resolved before May 29. The elections were in, in February, that's about four months. What's the difficulty about resolving these cases well before the handover? Kenya has a procedure whereby they lay out a policy, there shall be no inauguration until the petitions are complete. And in the OAS uh, uh, panel, which I was a member, we, we set out that procedure. There's a certain unfairness for a petitioner to challenge the president, a president-elect who goes on to get inaugurated. That's what's causing all the problem. So let's give it a go. Let the judiciary give it a go. Let the lawyers in the, in the tribunal give it a go to see whether we cannot accomplish what I've described in my letter. So that's the base of my letter. All right. Ruben. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Agbakoba. Good morning and good to see you. One of the things I'd like to ask you, you've yeah, painted you. a very good picture in terms of how things can work if it's settled as you recommended. However, yes. there are still a few mm -hmm. challenges, perhaps. Um, as Dr. Abati cited, 180 days is the time stipulated, and then a further 60 days if you were to appeal the decision of the, um, of the, of the no. courts. Now, no, no, no. Uh, uh, you're sorry, so, sorry to cut you. Yes. Sorry to cut you short. Yes, you are wrong. Okay. okay. Nothing says you must take the one. Nothing says you must take the 180 days. Nothing says you must yes, take the I 180 days. Yes, I said stipulated. Why do you That's suppose the amount that? Of time. Because there's a timeline. No, yes. no, no. Not. So I no, said that's no, the timeline no. given. You can go on the first day. Yes, I agree with you. But I said you can go in you, on the first day. But the applicant yeah. has 180 days. That's what I mentioned. But you're recommending that he, do, he doesn't. He, he doesn't. He, do, he, he, he doesn't. If Peter B is pushing his petition, and he wants the president elect not to be inaugurated, why should he wait for 180 days? If he files the petition, he ought to put in applications for a summary judgment. Why must he wait? That's the mistake. Kenya has 30, a 30-day 30 timeline. Nobody waits for the end of the timeline. Once you file your petition, you should be ready to make preemptory strikes. So if I was in the petition, I filed the petition on Monday. On Tuesday, I will file all my papers and request the court to determine certain jurisdictional questions. The fact that I have 180 days doesn't mean I should wait to 179 days to then begin to hustle. Everybody agrees that the policy is overheated. So we need speed. Okay. All right, so that brings me to my question, Dr. Bakoba. Of the petition. Yes. So that brings me to my yes. question. Despite what you have said in terms of you don't yes. have to wait for the 180 days, you can do it on day one. Some, the petitioner and some yeah. um, um, actors in this matter have said that they encounter challenges. So the question I was going to pose to you is that, why are, what are some of the areas that would prove difficult for this to be actualized? This picture you've painted in terms of seven days, you mm -hmm. can have it sorted. What are some of the challenges? I bring to question, or perhaps um, ask mm -hmm. you the question around the uh, access, for instance, to the back end or CTC of uh, an INEC preventing that access, delays mm -hmm. in um, getting your materials ready for the case. Are these some of the deliberate, perhaps, or not deliberate uh, issues that might come up in making your proposal a reality? Yeah. The point is that in modern judicial case management philosophy, there are steps you take to arrive at a conclusion. So step one would mean that if the decision of the tribunal states that 25% of uh, FCT is not required, that point fails. If the tribunal says that 25% of FCT is required, then the petition succeeds. Now, so as you go up the steps, you will come to the point where the most difficult question will be posed, which is electoral irregularity. Mr. Robert Clark was on your program yesterday, and he gave a description of how petitions work. Petitions work on two levels. The first one is the technical level. 
all the three points I laid out, they are jurisdictional, they don't need any facts. You don't need a single documentation from INEC because on the facts, Mr. Tinubu did not win 25% in Abuja. So you don't need any access from INEC. It's stated in the petition. So the question is a legal question. What is the consequence of Mr. Tinubu not getting 25% in Abuja? Is it fatal or is it not fatal? You don't need any uh, recourse to INEC for any documentation. If the question is answered in the negative, Tinubu goes through. If it is answered in the positive, Tinubu loses. You go to the next question. What is the consequence of Mr. Tinubu's uh, vice presidential candidate being on the ballot of senatorial? Is it fatal in view of Section 35 of the Constitution, one way or the other? And, on, and so on and so forth. So you exhaust the jurisdictional and procedural questions. If all those questions succeed, then you are within the time to dismiss the petition or allow it. Now, the more difficult one is if the procedural and jurisdictional points do not succeed. Then we are bogged down by the electoral uh, irregularities, and I agree here that access to documentation will be necessary. But to sit down and do nothing, I haven't, I haven't heard a theme from the courts, I haven't heard a theme from the legal team, is the point that I'm saying is irritating. And the polity is overheated. The that day, Mr. Lai Mohammed was in, a, in, in the UK, in the, in the US, shouting treason. Mr. Tinubu, uh, Mr. Peter Obi is here making his own war. But we can resolve all this and have peace if the petition is decided, one way or the other, on technical points. If it fails, and I, I take the point that it's possible that it will fail, then we go to step two, which is evidential hearings. Well, you recently expressed doubt about the capacity, or maybe we use a milder word, the ability of our courts to deliver untainted justice, and hence the reference to the Ahmad Lawan yes. case. Now, look also at the uh, lawyers. They wait till the last day, the very last day before they file uh, uh, petitions. So, don't we have a problem mm. of capacity here? and also integrity. What uh, people can do, once upon a time in this country, election petitions used to take three years. Even the uh, 180 days outer limit now is uh, an improvement. And now you are saying, oh, you can do this thing in seven days. Would, would that not subvert the objective of justice? The speech. Yeah, told you, didn't, so long as you deliver a good decision, <laughs> if you give a man an opportunity to say, you are saying that Mr. Tinubu should not be president on the basis that he didn't win this. Tell me why. Do you need, for, for, do you need uh, 20 days to do that? You don't need 20 days. It's a legal question whether and in Section 134 is contiguous or not. It's very simple. A bench ruling can be given on that. I've done big uh, arbitrations in the city of London and decided the point in three hours. So there's nothing that... You see, the problem is... Our judicial philosophy, I'm just looking at the Kenyan one, it says here, sustaining judiciary transformation. That's the Kenyan one. Sustaining judiciary transformation. How can this country, the so-called giant of Africa, run a judicial system that is 100 years old? That's the problem. The no. NJC is not doing anything to create a new... Yes. You know, I, get, I get that point about best practices, where, about gold standard and yes. all of that. But this uh, section 134, yes. you have referred to it about twice now as yes. one of the questions to be addressed. Now, you raised the issue in January when you wrote yes. a letter to INEC asking INEC for a possible interpretation yes. of section 134. Well, I would like to know whether you got a reply. Yes. And then as a senior advocate of Nigeria, what's your own opinion, <laughs> which you have not documented, about the interpretation of that section 134, sub 2 in particular? Well, I did a letter to INEC, and if they had answered me, maybe you wouldn't have been in this, in this log jam. But I had an interview. They didn't reply, by the way. But I had the closest they came to reply was an interview I did on TVC with uh, my good friend, Fessus Okoye. And he admitted that it was an issue that required to be resolved. And I was surprised that they did nothing. My own view is that Section 134 applied literally, literally, because the rules of interpretation say if you read something and it's so clear to you, then you don't need to interpret it. The thing says you must win a quarter of the votes in two thirds of 36 states. And. and, and, 
So, so what do you want to say? The answer is obvious. So the presidential candidate the does, does not have to get 25% in FCT. Otherwise, it will amount to an absurdity. If he already has 25% in, say, about 20 the, states. No, I didn't say that. I said no, that I want you to break, you break it down. I want you to break it down in a way that the other man... I'm just it down. <laughs> no, let's apply I've it. Just, I've, let's... Just, I've just broken it down. <laughs> uh, Ruben, I've broken it down. You, have, you want to put words in my mouth, which I won't accept. It's so simple. You get a quarter of the votes in 25%, in a quarter of the votes in two-thirds of 36 states. That is what the law says, which is 24. So that's one part of it. It goes on to say, and, what does that mean? And the FCT. So as far as I'm concerned, you must also win 25% in the FCT. But that's not for me to say, because I'll be judging what is before the, um, the tribunal. So we think the tribunal can answer this question quite easily in one hour. That's my point. Quite easily. All right. It's not a difficult question to resolve. All right. Well, Dr. Bakoba, you also talk about, just going back to what uh, the question that had been asked previously around your confidence in the judiciary, you had said in an interview, in a previous interview, that in the past yes. you could look at the weight, you could analyze the case before the, uh, the, uh, the court and be able to make a decision that would possibly tally with what the court would come up with based on the merits of the case. But in recent times, and you cited a few cases where this had happened, yes. it's not quite the same. I'd like you to speak a bit on that in terms of the confidence or lack yes. of that you have in the courts. And second of that question is on INEC's role as a respondent. What you have said is that INEC should come in as a neutral witness, where they're just coming to present to the courts the facts or, or yes. the act, what actually happened during yes. the elections. Unfortunately, what we see happening is that INEC comes in almost as if working with the respondent, yeah. so coming to defend, and in your words, with sweat and blood, what had happened, and this ought not be the case. I'd like you to speak a bit more on that, please. Yes. No, absolutely. You remember when uh, Mr. Shif Shadari of Blessed Memory was president, he acknowledged that the process that brought him was flawed, and he set up the OIS panel, and I was a member. And we came up with a set of recommendations which has not been implemented today. One of the key recommendations was INEC must not be a party. Because if INEC becomes a party, it's forced to defend the petition. The last election in 2019, INEC was even more active than Mr. Buhari in defending the petition. The only rule for INEC is to just to say to the tribunal, these are the results. These are the documents we used, and the courts will assess it. So I'm of the strong opinion that INEC ought not to be a party at all. So now INEC is a party, and therefore it is hiding documents, because it has an interest to say that the elections were conducted properly. So I hope that the lesson from all this, really, is that the 10th Assembly will inaugurate all the legislative recommendations we made on that OAS in 2007. It's time, to, it's time to demystify election petitions. Election petitions are not, not, not difficult. I've handled a lot more difficult and complex financial cases in the city of London. So what is the issue about determining whether Section 35 states that if you are a vice presidential candidate on a, on, 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 on a, on a party's platform, you couldn't be uh, a senatorial candidate at the same time? What, what, is there any difficulty in that? It's simple English. That would take me two minutes to decide. So I still reiterate, seven days is enough time to go through the Court of Appeal at first instance and the Supreme Court. The only way, place where there might be a difficulty is if the questions I set out fail. And there's a strong possibility that they might fail. So we'll now go to part B of the case management issue, which is Peter O.B. and other petitioners will now have to prove the irregularities set out in the petition. That would be a long time. And I guess that's why there's the 180 day timeline. But before we get to the 180 day timeline and part B of the petition, what about part A? And I think the overall concept is Nigeria needs to cool down. It, the whole place is overheated, mainly because of petitions. So the judicial philosophy behind this thing should be that the courts must be proactive. Proactive. And I, as I, let me repeat again since the petitions have been filed, not a statement has come from the courts. And that's unfortunate. Court ought to set practice directions to say, we can see what's going on in Nigeria. As a result, we set these questions down. 
we hereby issue procedural order number one and set out these questions and invite counsel on both sides to address us. And once we hear the addresses, the judgment will be delivered the following day, one way or the other. Why can't they do that? Well, two That's my simple point. Why can't they do that? I would like to know. Well, two quick things. One, you alluded to the statement made by uh, yes. Alaji Lai Muhammad, uh, Minister of Information and Culture. Yes. The effect uh, that uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Peter mm -hmm. Obi and his uh, running mate, uh, Dati Baba Ahmed, uh, have made statements that could make them uh, uh, liable for treasonable uh, felony. And then the second thing, <laughs> yes. the second thing yes. will be what you think of all this general talk about interim national government and the DSS coming forward to say, well, that's a mm. taboo subject because it will, it will amount to subversion. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but you see, the problem is because there's a strong feeling that Mr. Tinubu will be sworn in and the petitions are running. And there's that feeling, ah, but if the man is sworn in, then what are we doing in the courts? That's the problem. And that's why I say, let's get these petitions resolved. I don't agree with Mr. Lai Mohammed that what Mr. Obi is saying is treason. I don't agree. But if we go below what the problem is, it's to do with the fact that Mr. Tinubu is likely to be sworn in on 29th of May 2023, whilst the petitions are not even heard. So why don't we try, even if we fail? Suppose my theory of seven days doesn't work. But let us try now. Let's try to see if we can get it going. And if we get it going, that is a plus for everybody. Why must we be in this continuous political you know, uh, quagmire of everywhere is in confusion? I really would urge the tribunal and legal team on both sides to do their possible best to push this case to the possible limit where we can see if there can be a conclusion before the swearing in. But clearly, I have said that I do not believe and the conscience does not recognize anything like an interim government. It's a total con a contraption. So as it stands now, Mr. Ahmed Walatinubu is the president-elect, whether we like it or not. And he's going to be sworn in on May 29th, whether we like it or not. Many guys are going to be unhappy because they will say we have petitions. So in order to balance out justice, could we please get these petitions if they can be resolved before that date so that everybody is happy? If Peter B loses, then he goes home and knows he's lost. But why, why hang the thing? I can understand Peter B's concern and Dati Mohammed's outburst if Mr. Tinobu is being sworn in at Eagle Square and the petition is hanging in um, the, the Court of Appeal. That doesn't sound too right to me. So where we strike the balance is to give our best possible shot to finish the petitions. Let us at least try. There's no point all sitting down and saying, can it be done? Let's try to see if it can be done. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad that you talk about and you push a strong case for the fact that it can be done, even though it's never been done in Nigeria, but doesn't rule out the possibility that it can be done. But I asked the question earlier, and I'd like you to uh, revisit it if possible. Bearing in mind all the things you said, mm -hmm. why is it then not an option to take? Why is it taking so long? As you mentioned, the courts haven't yet responded, at least um, until now, to the petition submitted by both Mr. Pitobi and Alaji Atiku, because a, a number of parties did submit their petitions. What is stopping judi judiciary? Mm -hmm. What is the barrier? Why can't we achieve this? What are the issues? I know we've talked about you know, justice being served, not to sub subvert justice, but what are the bigger <laughs> issues beyond just a will to make this happen? Look, I sat on the NJC, the National Judicial Council, for almost four years, and I found the place toughy and very conservative. And I pushed the case all the time that the National Judicial Council ought to do a lot more than it is doing. And that's the problem. We need to modernize the justice sector delivery process. I've got a case in court, even though I'm former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, it has sat in the High Court for 12 years. 12 years. Some cases take 20 years. There's something wrong. The confidence in the judiciary, which I expressed at an interview, I think, uh, with channels, is the fact that people say if you go to court, you don't get any, 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 any decision. You just sit down there. So isn't it time that the National Judicial Council can say, look, no, no, there's something wrong here. We need to shake things up. 
And that's what um, this uh, Ghana did, and that's what Kenya did. Kenya, how is it possible that Kenya can finish down in one day? And we can't. We have more judges than Kenya. We had our uh, judges out in Kenya training people, sitting on their high courts. So why can't we do it? We're not doing it because of lethargy. Th that's all. There's no other reason. The, the, the elections were on 25th of February, 25th February to March 25th. This is going a month and a half. Nothing. That is that beggar's belief, as far as I'm concerned. Beggar's belief. So okay. let I appeal to our, our legal system to shake the entire thing up. I've been in, at this thing of reform of the judiciary for the last 25 years, and I've only seen two judges, two CJNs that I am proud to say were very vocal. The first was Mr. Justice Belgore. You know, remember when uh, OBJ was going around the whole place doing impeachments? I, as NBA president, and the uh, Belgore CJN stopped it. We absolutely stopped it. We said, we won't have this nonsense. We issued practice directions, and it stopped. The other one was when Mr. Justice Dahiru Mustafa was the CJ of Nigeria. But unfortunately for him, he only stayed six months. He came out, I was a consultant, he came out with a radical set of new rules, which if had been implemented, wouldn't be in this, in this, in the, in this morass we are in. So please, can the NJC give some bite to the judicial process so that it can be confidence? Because confidence in the judiciary, as a result of the slow snail pace of cases, is affecting the public confidence of people to go to uh, take their cases decided. And that's what's happening in Nigeria. People have filed a, a petition, nothing has happened since it was filed, and the NJC is sitting down there, and the electoral uh, tribunal is sitting down there, not saying a word. I don't think that's right. Well, maybe some people will even add that uh, the starting point is probably a reform of the NJC itself. But this uh, conversation has been Absolutely. about... Absolutely. <laughs> this conversation yeah. has been about the election petitions at the presidential level. Will you make the yes. same yes. argument at the state yes. level? Will you make the same argument at the state level? Considering the fact that, you know, the state, at the state level, the level of uh, incapacity is even worse. And I ask you, is anybody listening this time around? Is anybody listening this time around? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the problem, uh, Ruben. No one's, no one's listening. That's the problem. Nobody's listening. I pushed this thing about judicial reform for 30 years. Nobody is listening. But could we please get our people to listen? That's why, that's why our democracy is fragile. Okay, if we say that... Uh, I think I've lost you. Okay, can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. If this is where we have found I can. ourselves. Yeah, I can hear you. If this is where we have found ourselves, the pe people resisting ideas and all of that, well, it means, as you pointed out, that by May 29, we will have a presidential inauguration. Now, you talked in the past about yes. the ideal president for Nigeria will be a president that can deliver hope. Now, the president-elect on the platform of the yes. APC, he's talking about restoration of hope. Do you think that Bola Ahmed Chinumbu would fit into that picture, that your picture of an ideal president? I don't know. I hope. I just pray. I mean, what I think, personally, I'm a political. So whoever gets in there, I'm interested in Nigeria turning around. So I would hope that if Mr. Tinubu gets in and is done with all the petition or Mr. Pito B or whoever, I'm not sure, look, you know the point, I'm not sure Nigerians really care who is the president. Nigerians are interested in what Fayoshe, you know, famously described as stomach democracy or OBJ described as dividends of democracy. So I would urge whoever finally gets to be confirmed Nigerian president to just do right by Nigerians. And if Mr. Tindu can do so, welcome. If it is B2B, Nigerians are just tired. They aren't interested in you know, who is there particularly. They're interested in how development can come, how you, the healthcare system can be turned around, how you can create jobs, how you can push back on employment, how you can increase the debt to revenue profile, how you can make Nigeria a country where we feel blessed and we don't have people you know, running away. Nigeria has the potential to be a great country, but we need leadership. So if Tidubu can bring it, fine. If Mr. Peter B can bring it, fine. I have no political preferences. My only, my only concern is that Nigeria ought to be a great country. 
And I think it can be a great country. All right, but it's losing the ability to be a great country. That's the problem. Okay, so I must um, touch on this interim government. I know you talked about the fact that what um, yes. Alajilai Mohammed had said with regards to Mr. Pitobi is largely unfounded in terms of it being treasonable. But you have spoken about this DSS's um, talk about some people, no names mentioned, uh, trying to find a way towards an interim government. And you talk about there being no constitutional provision for one. In the 1999 constitution, there is no provision for an interim government. However, this term has been bandied yes. a lot in the last few weeks. In fact, perhaps even before the elections, you know, here and there, that if this doesn't happen, there'll be an interim government. Yeah. What should the government be doing? Mm. They haven't released names, you know, as to who is, they said it's going to be through protests, unrest, making, you know, the nation ungovernable, and then going to an interim government before a swearing-in can happen. What's your take on this? If there's no provision for it in the, mm. in the constitution, who are the people clamoring for it? How will this, mm. how do they hope to go about doing this? Mm. And how can this be nipped in the bud? Mm. Yeah, see, but that's, that's the whole essence of what I've been saying. The problem is what we call in logic, cause mm. and effect. The cause of all this cry for an interim government and the response by Lai Mohammed and the DSS is because they want Mr. Tinubu to be inaugurated by May 29, irrespective of the decision of the tribunal. The other guys don't want because they think it's unfair. That's the real problem. That's the real problem. So I'm not really concerned with, you know, uh, the call for interim government, which I think is, you know, is, is unconstitutional. My concern is I've identified the problem as if I were a medical doctor. And I can see that if we really resolve the petition, then the issue of, okay, look, if the petition comes down on a decision on 23rd of May, then we have no problem because 29th of May is ahead. So let us say Mr. Mr. B loses. Then Mr. Uh, Tinu can then go on peacefully to be inaugurated. There will be no call, oh, you are getting inaugurated, but you have still got a case in the, in, the, in, in, in the courts. So the real issue would be let us all put our energy to resolve the petition. If we resolve the petition, all the questions you ask about interim government, DSS, the slander, the issue of treason will disappear. So my central concern is, can we please finish this petition in good time so that the president who takes over in, on May 29 will have peace of mind and no distractions to face the huge problem? The, the incoming president will face a terribly, uh, defectively broke country of almost 80 trillion naira. That's going to be a huge, huge obstacle. And then if you put the wahala of is his presidency legitimate, legitimate, that would make it very unstable for him. So let me go back again and repeat. Can we please get these petitions away so that whoever is the president can focus on giving us a brilliant and good and developed Nigeria with an agenda that I've read all the agendas, Peter B's agenda, it's, it's brilliant. Mr. Tinubu's agenda is brilliant. Whether they can implement is a different thing. But I don't want them to come with the problem of uncertainty around Nigeria, interim government and all that. That can be resolved. And that's the reason that I have so strongly emphasized, let us try and get this petition away from the equation. Ghana, uh, 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 Kenya can okay. do theirs okay. in 14 days. Why do we need 360 days to do ours? Can you think of that? Is that not uh, ridiculous? A small Ghana, Kenya, okay, yeah. You can say Kenya is a small country, so they don't have the mass of uh, materials that we have. But let's try. What, 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 what stirs my soul is we just sit down helplessly and do nothing. Let's give it our best shot. If we fail, we know we've done our, we've done our best. But just to sit down, no one is saying anything. The courts are saying nothing. The legal advisors are saying nothing. And we're all here moaning. Every day we hear something new, interim government, treason. No, come on. Let's give it a shot. That's my point. Alajilai Muhammad in the U.S. yesterday was telling his audience that his mission was to balance the narrative. And he told his uh, audience that this 2023 general election that we have had has been the best election ever conducted in Nigeria, the most authentic, the 
fairest, the most credible, and that Beavers was a game changer with about 97% service delivery. And then he pointed out that Mr. Peter will be has nothing to say, that he came third in the uh, election, and that how can somebody who came third, who did not even satisfy the condition in section 135, be claiming that uh, his mandate has been taken away uh, from him. So it will look like, I mean, it, according to that, uh, Mr. Um, uh, um, Lai Mohammed, it's better to just talk about maybe Ashwaju Tinubu uh, and then uh, Atiku Abubakar of the PDP, and that uh, Labour Party has no case whatsoever. How do you react to that is logic? Well, let me just even push back on a few things I said, you know, because being a lawyer and former MBA president, it, I have to be careful that I'm speaking live, people are listening to me, while there's an active petition. So I think I, I, would, I would sort of like like to push back on, let's allow the, um, what, what do you call it, the, the petition uh, deciders, the electoral, the, the um, uh, election petition tribunal resolve some of these issues. Let's not, yeah, we can express opinions, but I would rather prefer that the uh, judicial process be the ultimate decider so that we don't go prejudicing and speaking out of turn. But having said that, I think that neither uh, Mr. Tinubu nor uh, Lai Mohammed can really quarrel with Peter B's complaint that the elections were not properly run. And in fairness to Mr. Tinubu, he didn't conduct the election, so I don't hold anything against him. Mr. Tinubu did not do anything wrong in becoming the presidential, uh, the president-elect, because the election was done by a supposedly neutral third party. So I, I'm not sure that Mr. Tinubu or Mr. Lai Mohammed needs to get into the fray, because they didn't conduct it. They're not the electoral management body. It's Peter B's accusation or complaint goes to INEC. But if you were to ask my view, and I've been in election petitions for a long time, this is one of the worst uh, uh, election petitions ever conducted. I say this for a number of reasons. First, if you listen to the chairman of the electoral uh, um, uh, management body, the INEC, he made clear to us, ad nauseum, Bivax is the magic. Now it turns out that Bivax wasn't the magic. And I had the unfortunate displeasure of actually checking what exactly is Bivax in the law. And I was shocked that actually Bivax is not what we thought was represented to us by the National Assembly in the enactment of the Electoral Act 2023. To summarize, Bivax is no more than a tool to accredit a voter. So I suspect, without saying that is the way it will go, but I suspect that Bivax is not going to be as important in the petitions as we think. Because the Oyo, the Oshun Court of Appeal decision did not accept the argument by the appellant that the BVAX is the magic vote that determines over voting. The court wanted to see a link to the original old ballot papers. In other words, the presidential polling units become important. And, and I was taken aback by that. So when I studied it, I found out that actually... INEC has the legal authority to present results either through the normal paper way and the BVAX. So there will be no real change. No real change. So I, I hope that in the next round of amendments, we should really be very clear. What exactly is electronic voting, number one? What is the consequence for not following electronic voting? The only consequence now is a criminal charge. 500,000 Naira. So there's still a lot to go in stating how we can get to the gold standard of our electoral process. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Olisa Agbakoba, for joining us on the morning show today. <laughs>